for joining in today. Um, I'm glad you glad you've you've joined in on this this beautiful day in the beginning of beginning of fall here. Um, I'm glad Jim Asselstein has joined us as our, our guest presenter. Uh, Jim is the founder of the Dorflinger Factory Museum in Holly. Uh, he is a past president of the American Associ American Cut Glass Association, as well as the fellows of the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, Jim is a collector and scholar of Dorflinger, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of Christian Dorflinger himself and the museum um, and the foundation of the new Dorflinger Factory Museum that opened in 2016. So I'll turn it over to turn it over to Jim. Um, and again, thank you for joining us and please welcome Jim Essel. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks very much for inviting me to uh, uh, to do this. Well, as Sarah said, I'm going to uh, talk a bit uh, about um, the history of the Dorflinger companies, both in Brooklyn and in White Mills, and then uh, the founding and the establishment of the uh, Dorflinger Factory Museum, including the restoration of the last uh, uh, two buildings that remained from the factory. So let's start with a little bit of history. Christian Dorflinger was born in 1828 uh, in uh, the Alsace region of France. He started his apprenticeship uh, to become a uh, journeyman glassblower at age 10. He completed his apprenticeship program at the Cristallerie de Saint-Louis uh, uh, at age 18. And that is when he emigrated to the United States. Came here with his mother, his three sisters, and his brother. And after a short trip uh, to Indiana to locate his uh, mother and sisters uh, with relatives, he and his brother returned to the East Coast and Christian Dorflinger worked as a glassblower for the uh, Union Glassworks in Philadelphia for about five years. Made some connections and contacts and then opened his first glass factory on Concord Street in Brooklyn. And you can see the oval uh, down there on the map. Uh, he started with a small blowing shop, which we believe he leased, and he started by making commercial things. So chimneys for kerosene lamps, pharmacy equipment, uh, and so generally uh, commercial uh, lines to begin with. He was successful, and so by uh, 1856, uh, 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 he was cutting glass and starting to produce the fine uh, luxury cut glass tableware that he'd been trained to make in France. In 1858, he opened a larger factory on Plymouth Street, as you can see right on the East River, which had better transportation access. And then in 1860, he built a still larger factory on Commercial Street up at the upper edges of Brooklyn between what is now Brooklyn and Queens, right on Newtown Creek. And it was the, um, uh, the Greenpoint Flint Glass Works on Commercial Street that produced the uh, Lincoln Table Service uh, and really established Dorflinger's reputation. Now, we do not have images of the Plymouth Street factory, but fortunately for us, there are images on this beautiful tea service produced by Wood and Hughes. And this service was a gift to Christian Dorflinger in 1863 when he left New York uh, to move to, uh, to White Mills. And so we do see wonderful images of the Plymouth Street factory on this tea service. And here is the other side of the tea service with the uh, dedication of the gift to Christian Dorflinger. So on the Sugar Bowl, you have a nice exterior view of the Plymouth Street factory, the blowing shop on the right, offices to the left, and in the center of the cutting shop. And here's a little more, a little closer up view of the, uh, of the image of the factory. On the other side of the factory, here is the factory yard. Uh, you can see barrels in the, uh, in the center, blowing shop again here to the center, and then uh, cutting shop to the right. Here's a little bit of a close-up view of that image as well. On the creamer, you have the interior of the blowing shop, and here you see a, uh, a gaffer uh, working on a piece of glass at his, uh, at his bench. 
And then finally on the waste bowl, you have a pot room where the clay pots were used to melt the glass uh, were made and then heated and dried. And then finally, on several of the pieces, you have this wonderful glass gaffer uh, on, the, uh, on the top. So really just a magnificent uh, silver service. This came down in the Dorfinger family, and it's now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we know Christian Dorflinger was cutting by 1856. The earliest piece of dated Dorflinger glass that we uh, know of is this baby cup. Uh, the name on the baby cup is William Dorflinger. Uh, that was Christian uh, and Elizabeth Dorflinger's eldest son. He was born in 1853, and the baby cup is dated 1856. So we know he was cutting by then. Okay. Uh, the Greenpoint factory, we do have tra uh, trade cards and letterhead that show the Greenpoint uh, Flint Glass Works. Again, blowing shop to the left, cutting shop beside it. And uh, Dorflinger, by this point, was doing something really interesting and innovative. On the right-hand side, you have tenement housing that he built for his glass workers. So he's pretty forward-thinking about the way he thought about how to manage his business and also how to take care of his uh, workers. And as I mentioned, the Greenpoint factory was the factory that produced the Lincoln table service. Here is a factory sample wine glass. Uh, this was a really revolutionary design with this light and delicate glassware, the fine diamond cutting on the bottom of the bowl, this beautiful engraved ivy band around the top rim and the presidential coat of arms, the U.S. coat of arms uh, as part of the, uh, the design. Uh, this uh, design was very popular, received a lot of attention, uh, and really helped establish Christian Dorfinger's reputation. Uh, this wine glass is in the collection of the Everhart Museum, and it's actually on display now at the Dorfinger Glass Museum in White Mills. Here is a dessert wine, also in the collection of the Dorfinger Glass Museum uh, with a solid cranberry bowl. Uh, just beautiful examples of uh, uh, work done in the 1860s. And then finally, uh, the punch cup. Uh, again, another great example. Punch cups are actually quite rare uh, because so many of them were broken, but the White House just ordered, reordered plain ones. And this is also in the collection of the Dorfinger Glass Museum in White Mills. The painting is of Christian Dorfinger, age 35, right about the time that he left New York and moved to, uh, to White Mills. He purchased a farm in White Mills from his friend uh, and business associate, uh, Captain Aaron Flower in New York. Uh, and Christian Dorflinger and his family moved to White Mills in 1863. Now the family folklore has it that he was exhausted and for health reasons, he was retiring to the country, leaving the glass business, but we think all along really had in mind for the new and much larger in White Mills. And that's exactly what he did two years later in 1865. All of these New York glass company owners were beginning to think about how they could relocate their business out of New York, lower their cost of operations, move to areas with more land uh, where they could build larger uh, uh, and more cost efficient factories. Uh, and so these guys, in order to make that move, really needed two things. They needed a reliable, low-cost supply of coal for their furnaces, and they needed excellent transportation arrangements to bring in the raw materials to make this very high-quality lead crystal and also to deliver their finished goods to market. We think what happened is Dorfinger visited his friend uh, who uh, owned a farm in White Mills, and saw the potential for uh, locating a glass factory there. And White Mills fulfilled uh, both of those key elements because you had the Delaware and Hudson Canal uh, going right uh, past White Mills and there was a lock in White Mills. So this photograph shows the basin right uh, adjacent to the Dorflinger factory. You can see the barrels with tin lining those were used to bring the sand, the lead, and the potash upriver 
uh, to uh, white mills uh, for glass fabrication, and then the canal boats going uh, downstream could take uh, Dorflinger's finished goods to market. Now, when Dorflinger opened the factory in 1865, he also knew that the railroad was coming to White Mills. You'll see the bridge across the canal and the Lackawaxen River. Dorflinger paid to construct that bridge because he knew the train station was coming on the other side of the river. And sure enough, in 1868, the Honesdale branch of the Erie Railroad reached White Mills. Here you can see the original White Mills station. It's not a very good image, unfortunately, but in the background, uh, against the hillside, you can see the, uh, the growing village of White Mills. Dorflinger started in White Mills, much as he started in Brooklyn, with a small operation. So in 1865, he opened uh, a, um, a blowing shop, a small blowing shop, which is uh, on the rock to the right, and to the left was the pot house where the clay pots for the furnace were made. He started off initially by hiring farm workers from local farms who could do much of the basic work of the factory, but he also knew that he really needed skilled craftsmen. So by 1866 to 67, he went to France and uh, hired or uh, brought back uh, three families of glass blowers to help him get the factory started. And he built seven cottages uh, this is one of those cottages, glass workers house number five, in the winter of 1866 to 67 to house those workers. They were all related to each other, uh, all came from the same region of France where Dorflinger came from. Some of them he had actually even known uh, in, uh, in France and had trained with at San Luis. This worker's cottage um, number five is part of the Dorflinger Sudan Wildlife Sanctuary and has been restored to show what these workers' houses look like in about 1875. By 1868, the factory is growing pretty rapidly. So you see the workers' cottages in the back, the, uh, the original blowing shop, the pot house. Now you have the cutting shop in the front and the two-story building was the packing department and the uh, original wholesale showroom in White Mills. We know by 1868, he was cutting in White Mills. This is the earliest dated piece uh, of cut glass made in White Mills. It dated December 25th, 1868. The cologne bottle was made for Eugene Dorflinger as a Christmas gift to his uh, fiance, uh, Clotilde King. Uh, and um, I'll come back to these a little bit later, but Two of those original workers who came here in 1867 were Nicholas and Francois Lutt, and they made those glass flowers that you see in the, uh, in the stopper. And the cologne bottle here also is yeah, a museum. And here's a close up of the engraving on the, uh, on the cologne. Okay. Uh, this painting done in 1875 shows again the rapid growth that was taking place at the factory and also in White Mills. Uh, this painting was done by a man named William Christen, who worked in the decorating department for Dorflinger until 1875. This was done uh, relatively soon before he, uh, he left White Mills. Uh, and it's a, just a beautiful representation of the, uh, of the town at that point. Uh, this uh, painting was in the Dorflinger family, and it is now um, a part of the June Dorflinger Hardy collection uh, in the Dorflinger Glass Museum in White Mill. So you see the factory complex to the center left, the farm where Dorflingers originally lived in White Mills, up at the top of the hill to the left. You see more workers' houses that have been built. In the center uh, is St. Joseph's Catholic Church that was actually completed about a year later after this painting was done. And then um, to the right, you'll see a small building with two front windows uh, right next to the road. That was the company store operated by Eugene Dorflinger, Christian Dorflinger's cousin. And to the very right, the St. Charles Hotel. Dorflinger built the St. Charles Hotel 
1868 so that his customer and his friends from New York would have a place to stay. Uh, in 1873, he built the large wing to the right of the St. Charles Hotel, and the family moved from the farmhouse down there. That became their home. Eventually, he closed the St. Charles Hotel, and that's where the family lived uh, in the entire building for the remainder of their time uh, in White Mills. This engraving was published in the History of Pike Wayne in Monroe Counties in 1886. And again, it shows you the further growth and expansion of the factory. The older, early factory is to the center left in the back. And then to the front, you have the new factory. So the long uh, building uh, right in the front foreground was the new cutting shop, uh, the building attached to its front was uh, the new blowing shop. The perpendicular in building in the back was the decorating department and the smaller parallel building in the back was the engraving department. So you can see how rapidly White Mills was growing and expanding by 1886. Also published in the same volume was this engraving of the top floor of the new cutting shop. And let's see, yep. okay. Yeah, uh, so here is the factory office building built in about 1888. You can also see workers' houses behind the, uh, uh, the office building. The ground floor of the office building was where the bookkeepers and accountants work. The top floor of the office building, the wholesale showroom in White Mills. This image shows you the office building on the left, the new cutting shop on the right. This is about, uh, 1890, and you see this large fence around the property. Labor unrest hit the glass industry beginning in about 1888. That large fence was built to protect the, uh, the factory property, uh, and the gate was locked at night uh, to, protect the, uh, to protect the factory. Unfortunately, uh, that was unsuccessful, and there was very large fire in the factory in 1892. The fire broke out in the packing department uh, in the center of the factory, uh, and it was a suspicious origin. This was in the middle of the night. Uh, no flame was allowed in that building because of all the combustible materials. Uh, and as that building began to burn, the fire moved throughout the rest of the factory. This wooden structure behind the cutting shop caught fire. Uh, and rapidly spread through almost all of the buildings in the factory. The only buildings that were uh, not affected were the office building and the building where the clay pots were made. And here you see the effects of the, uh, of the fire. So you can see the furnace in the upper blowing shop, what's left of the furnace to the right. You can see the damage to the lower blowing shop uh, to the left center. And you can see the extensive damage was done to the new cutting. Here's another view. Uh, you can see the original steam boilers covered in asbestos uh, to the right front. You can also see the office building that was not really affected. Uh, Dorflinger rapidly rebuilt the factory. The blowing shop you see down at the front uh, in the background of this picture was back in operation in a week. And the cutting shop was rebuilt and back in operation in two months. Pretty remarkable. And here you can see how extensive the damage was. Really, you were left with the stone walls, and that was about it. Here's the rebuilt factory. Uh, looking into the factory from Charles Street, uh, you can see the peak roof of the office building, the uh, rebuilt cutting shop, the rebuilt blowing shop, and the completely rebuilt uh, upper uh, blowing shop as well to the, to the right. This view is 1898. It shows you the cutting department. At that, there were about, we've counted up about 65 cutters working in the, uh, in the cutting shop. And on the porch to the office building, you can see the bookkeepers and the accountants uh, up there in the photograph. Uh, at this stage, we think that the um, size of the workforce at Dorflingers was about 500 people. Uh, John Dorflinger, who was the last foreman of the cutting department, said that, that 
due to the operations, the workforce was about 650, but he had a, a tendency to exaggerate to some degree. So we think 500 is more about the right number. Uh, this is a view of the top floor of the office building where the wholesale showroom was located. You had these large tables, glass displayed on the surface of the tables. Another view of the other half of the room. You can see glass that's wrapped in brown paper under the table ready for uh, packing and shipping. Uh, this is a front view of the factory. So behind us would be Holly. Looking ahead would be the road that passed the factory toward Honesdale. Uh, you can see the rebuilt uh, blowing shop right in the center. The building to the right was the Ross Work Hotel. That was a hotel for single men who worked in the factory. In 1902, the hotel was moved and this last new blowing shop was added, giving the factory three large blowing shops. And in 1905, the last major addition to the factory was the chimney you see here to the right, and that for a coal gasification plant. So for that last blowing shop, Dorf brought by two minutes coal from Western Pennsylvania, uh, converted the coal to natural gas, and he used the natural gas to burn in that last, uh, in that last blowing shop. Uh, the, the natural gas was cleaner, hotter, and more consistent in temperature than coal. Uh, so that was the last innovation. We're looking ahead to the business district of White Mills uh, on the road as you go toward Homestead. So today, uh, the last two buildings that have survived from the factory are the office building, the 1888 office building, and the 1883 cutting shop. And those two buildings are now home uh, to the Dorfinger Factory Museum. I'll give you a few images of the restoration of the office building and the cutting shop. Here's the office building. Uh, so this building had been uh, by the previous owner converted to a home. Uh, so the downstairs had been divided up into a, like a dining room and a kitchen and upstairs in bedrooms. And here, putting the uh, wooden panels back, the cherry wooden panels back on the ground floor uh, to uh, restore the ground floor to its original appearance uh, as the factory office. Another view is the panels get put back together. Uh, some pieces were missing, so the lighter pieces, all cherry, uh, are the replacement trim pieces uh, that were made to, uh, to match the originals. <coughs> Uh, we brought all the electrical and mechanics up the back wall of the building uh, so that we wouldn't damage or disturb any of the, uh, of the woodwork as we brought new uh, electrical systems to the building. And here is the restored building. The lighter color wood is all chestnut. The darker wood is all cherry. And this building is just a remarkable example of interior Victorian uh, woodwork. It's just a, just a stunning building. Here's the original pay desk uh, where workers were paid so they would come in, come up to the pay desk and would be, uh, uh, would be paid uh, gold coins. And here's the original pay desk. This was still on the, uh, on the property. Uh, this floor is now our administrative offices. Another view, uh, again, you get a great view of the, uh, of the woodwork and the pay desk uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this building. The area where, where behind the door marked private, which is right behind me, uh, was basically Christian Dorflinger's office. It's not a very big space, it's now a kitchen. Uh, and so Christian Dorflinger really spent most of his time out in the, in the factory. Here's the, the restoration of the top floor, which was the wholesale showroom in White Mills, uh, as we're doing skim coating on the plaster walls, installing the new heating and air conditioning units, uh, and uh, restoring the, um, uh, the floor and, the, uh, and wood. Uh, here we're putting the decorative moldings back onto the, uh, the ceiling. Again, this, this space had been chopped up into bedrooms, so as we took everything out, uh, we were able to restore uh, everything to its original appearance. 
And here's what the top room looks like today. Uh, this is now our early glass gallery. So on this floor, we display uh, and exhibit glass made in the Brooklyn factories up through the early years in White Mills until time of the Philadelphia exhibition in 1876. This glass tends to be simpler, also harder to identify uh, because we don't have salesman's catalogs from those very early years. And the engravings that I showed you earlier, uh, we have uh, reprints of those on the, uh, on the wall. Another uh, nice view of the, uh, of the showroom. This is just a beautiful space. And some good examples of some of the early uh, Dorflinger glass here. So here is the cutting shop as we began the restoration. The restoration of the office took about three years. We did that one first um, because among other things, the roof, roof was shot. We were getting water intrusion and uh, the greatest urgent need was with the office building. And after we did the office, we began to turn our attention to the cut shop. Uh, the restoration of the cutting shop uh, took uh, an additional uh, five years. So about eight years total for the, uh, the project to date. This is what the inside of the cutting shop looked like when we first acquired the property. This is the middle floor. Another view as we're starting to clear everything out. And here's what it looked like, empty, still in pretty sound shape, but there was a fair amount of work that needed to be done here. And here's what that floor looks like uh, today. This was an exhibit of work by William Chiquillo, uh, who is a regional artist in this area, uh, does beautiful watercolors and collages. Uh, and we did this uh, special exhibit focused on baseball uh, in this area uh, last summer. Here's the top floor as we were starting the, um, uh, the restoration. Here after we've done the installation work. Here beginning as we put in the uh, new uh, electrical and mechanical systems and the new flooring. And then the museum today. Uh, this back brick addition onto the cutting shop was added in 1917 when the last steam boiler was installed in the factory. And this has now become a main entrance to the museum. We're really fortunate. Every floor in the cutting shop has an at-grade entrance. Uh, so it makes uh, uh, providing good um, accessibility into the building uh, fairly easy. So that 1917 edition has now become uh, the entryway to the museum. Uh, we have uh, a lovely model that shows the stages of the cutting process on the table here. Uh, some examples of vases and decanters uh, from, with some of our more famous patterns. Uh, this is also a pretty flexible space. We've used this space for lectures uh, and meetings as well. And here's a close up view of the model use full tours uh, when we're able to do those again, uh, usually uh, typically in early June. We're very fortunate because the high school history club here takes a very active interest in this part of the history of the community. And so uh, the man on the right is one of the high school students in the history club and they actually act as docents for the fourth graders uh, during the school tours. And that works very well. As the teachers say, uh, the fourth graders will listen much better to the high school kids than they will to us, to the, to the teachers. <laughs> so we move into the exhibit space. Uh, our first exhibit uh, deals with glass blowing. Unfortunately, the glass blowing shops are all gone, but we have a wonderful video from 1916 that actually shows glass blowing in the Dorflinger factory. We play that video on the monitor and the blowing bench and equipment and tools that we have here, as well as the glass blanks that you see, the glass before it's been cut or decorated, uh, all good examples of how glass blowing was done at the, uh, at the factory. Next, we have an exhibit of cutting. These are actually 
in frames from the Dorflinger factory showing the three different stages of the cutting process and the blow up of the photograph actually shows this floor when the factory was in operation. So you can look at the equipment and see exactly what the floor looked like if you look down the, uh, down the floor. And then we have a portion of the original line shaft at the top, uh, which is how the equipment in the factory was powered. We believe that the theme of how the glass was made is important, but we also think that a part of the story is how the glass was used in society. And so we've recreated a Victorian dining room in about 1895 uh, with the table set with Dorflinger glass in Dorflinger's Parisian pattern. Uh, and this is one of our more popular exhibits. The Ray Laternus uh, Gallery. Ray was a fifth generation glassmaker. He was a cutter. His family goes back to that first group of skilled craftsmen who Dorflinger brought here in 1867 to get the factory started. And this collection was put together by Ray over his lifetime. It's a wonderful study collection of Dorflinger glass. At the end of the room, we have our Brilliant Period Gallery. Uh, the Brilliant Period really started with the Philadelphia Exhibition in 1876 and went through World War I when this, began, this heavy, ornate, elaborate cut glass began to go out of fashion. But these were really the boom years of cut glass making in America. And we have some wonderful examples of work done uh, during this period of time. Then we have exhibits on um, marketing and how Dorflinger would package and market and sell his glass and the various art glass lines that Dorflinger developed beginning in about 1900 and going until the closure of the factory in 1921. Tastes were beginning to change and Dorflinger developed a number of really innovative art glass designs to try to keep pace with changing tastes and to offer his customers uh, something uh, new and more modern in its appearance. The final stage of the restoration process was the boiler room. This was the last steam boiler made by the Erie City Ironworks in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and installed in 1917. Steam from the boiler would power a large stationary steam engine, and we are really delighted to have this scale working model of a stationary steam engine. It is from the collection of the Lackawanna Historical Society. And you all have been very gracious in loaning it to us because it gives us the ability to explain to people how steam from the boiler drove the stationary steam engine and how belts attached to that large flywheel or to the uh, shaft of that large flywheel would then connect to the line and empower the cutting equipment in the factory. So a really wonderful um, uh, object and we're delighted to have it. To the right hand is the steam whistle that called everybody to work every morning, uh, <coughs> signaled their lunch break, sent them home at the, at the end of the day. If any of you have been to Corning, New York, the Corning Corporation still blows the whistle, even though the glassworks are gone, Corning in the morning and at lunchtime and at the end of the workday, which is really kind of a nice touch. And here's another view of the, uh, the boiler room. This is a great place for displaying art. Uh, so we like to display art, including art from uh, some of the local artists in the, uh, in the area. And it's also a, a neat, uh, flexible meeting space and entertainment space uh, as well. We also have another cutting frame here and again, under normal non-COVID conditions, people can wander around in this room and they can actually get close to and touch that cutting frame uh, to see how, exactly how the equipment operated. I'm gonna close with just a few quick views of Dorflinger glass pieces from the different uh, periods produced by the company. This is one of the earlier pieces produced by Dorflinger. This would have been in the Brooklyn factories, 1856 to 1858. Uh, it's a large open comport. These uh, vessels were used to serve a stewed fruit dessert mixture called compote. Uh, and so uh, this is pretty simple early. You can see the pattern isn't very elaborate. You've got a very large foot, a simple solid 
stem on the piece, uh, but you can also see uh, what the characteristics that really make Dorflinger glass so great, the quality of the glass and the quality of the workmanship. <clears throat> okay, here's another covered comport. This would have been uh, Greenpoint, so 1860 to 1865, a little more advanced in its design and its styling. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of glass, the ewer uh, with the engraved fish on the body of the ewer. Uh, this would have been most likely uh, late uh, Brooklyn, so 1865 to early White Mills, 1870. Uh, another pair of bottles with the Lutz uh, flower stoppers, so 1867 to, uh, to 1870. The Lutz brothers were only in White Mills for three years until 1870, and so we love to find uh, either paperweights or stoppers with the Lutz flowers from White Mills uh, year, uh, years. They're pretty rare. Beautiful example of decanters uh, from uh, 18, late 1860s to 1870, uh, the French shape, that light, delicate design with the gardens and the little dots almost like snowflake, really give you a feel uh, for how Dorflinger incorporated his French heritage and his experience at Saint Louis into the work he was doing in America. This chalice is cut in the same pattern as a very famous set, a decanter and wine glass set uh, that was exhibited by Dorflinger at the Philadelphia Exhibition. That set is now in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, most of it. Uh, there are actually three wine glasses from the set uh, in um, Wayne County, uh, two at the Dorflinger Glass Museum and one at the uh, Wayne County Historical Society, but the decanter and the bulk of the wine glasses are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And you can see how designs were now starting in the late 1870s to get more elaborate and more detailed. Another great example of a transition piece here. Uh, this was a 25th wedding anniversary gift made in 1879. We don't know who it was made for, uh, but you can see again how elaborate the cutting is getting both on the bowl with the alternating panels and the same repeat of the alternating panels on the foot uh, as well. Uh, and here's the inscription. We know it is a wedding anniversary gift because the Latin phrase at the top translates to an unbroken chain unites. Uh, table service uh, in the Parisian pattern, one of Dorfner's more famous patterns. This is a really elaborate set. You can see uh, the alternating panels of diamonds and fans going around the bowl, and those are repeated on the petals on the foot as well. Another famous early Dorflinger pattern, the Sultana pattern, is an expanding star pattern, and it's so visible when you look at the plate for the, uh, for the salad bowl, where the pattern starts at that central point, it just expands out to the edge. A loving cup, silver decoration or ornamentation uh, became very popular beginning in the 1890s. Uh, this loving cup, probably a wedding gift, is dated 1890. Also, Dorflinger was really known for the quality of the work that he did in color. Uh, this is a great example, and I'll show you a few more. Here is a cigar humidor in uh, the Montrose pattern. Uh, again, a great example of that really rich ruby red color. Pair of decanters in the Arcola pattern. You can see how extensive this pattern has become. It started out with the green coating over all of the glass, and you can see how much has been cut away in the central panels because of the detail on the pattern. Two great examples of stemware by Dorflinger in color. Uh, the poppy color on the right is a very unusual color. A wonderful classic Dorflinger uh, example of a shape of a vase. Uh, in the rich cut pattern. And, and you can see now how elaborate these patterns are getting. And this is probably the most elaborate pattern the company produced called pattern number 99. Uh, again, you can see how much of the red has been cut away because of the detail of the pattern. And then you have the beautiful silver rim on the top. This is a champagne jug 
So that's how champagne would have been served. <clears throat> Famous Dorflinger pattern, the Montrose pattern with these circles that are really almost like tiny fences alternating with the basket weave pattern. Uh, this is just a beautiful, beautiful pattern, also in that classic Dorflinger emerald green color. This large flower setter, this is about 16 inches in diameter, probably weighs about 20 pounds, uh, would have a large flower decoration in the center of the table. A couple of oil lamps, kerosene lamps, this one in Dorflinger's brilliant pattern, this one in the Gloria pattern. Dorflinger was, was known for uh, his work on lamps, uh, and Dorflinger probably produced more of these oil lamps than any other company. Uh, three pieces that came from the set of glassware produced for the wedding of William K. Vanderbilt Jr. and Virginia Graham Fair in New York in 1889. And all of these pieces, pieces exhibit a more modern uh, form of cutting called stone wheel engraving, lighter, more delicate with great leaves and floral designs. And then the silver was done uh, by Redlick and Company, a New York silversmith. So this is the wine ewer. Here is the water pitcher. And here is a large vase in the form of a loving cup. Uh, this vase, uh, another example of traditional cutting on the bottom and stone wheel engraving uh, in the center. This vase is identical to one given by uh, uh, the Dorflinger Company to the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 1903 to commemorate Christian Dorflinger's 75th birthday. Another example of a transition piece, traditional cutting <laughs> above and below, and then stone engraving in the center. And another example of stone engraving in color on this picture with the silver rim and on this cologne bottle uh, with the silver stopper. Again, that rare and unusual poppy color. The glass baseball bat, one of our most uh, popular attractions made in 1913 for a local baseball hero named Eddie Murphy. Eddie played on the White House team and went on to play for Connie Mack's Philadelphia Athletics. And so when the Athletics played the New York Giants in the 1913 World Series, Eddie's friends back at the factory made him this regulation size cut glass baseball bat and presented it to Eddie before the start of the second game of the series. And the Athletics won the series in five games. Uh, the only one ever made, so it's a one-of-a-kind item. This had been on loan to the Corning Museum of Glass for about 17 years by the Murphy family, and then eventually the Murphy family decided to sell it at auction, and we were able to bring it back to White Mills where we think it belongs. Um, this piece is an example of rock crystal done to imitate uh, traditional rock crystal off made in Asia where you carved clear quartz crystal. These are engraved and then polished. Very intricate, very elaborate pieces. These pieces were so difficult to make uh, that they were never put in production. So the only pieces we have were the factory samples. And we're happy to have three of those at the factory museum. There are also a couple of pieces in the Everhart collection and in the Dorfman Glass Museum as well. Finally, examples of the three art glass lines. Uh, this cameo vase made at, <laughs> by Dorflinger <coughs> and decorated at the Honesdale Decorating Company. You would use hydrofluoric acid to cut through the outer color layer to create the design, and then the gold decoration was added. And uh, these are heavily influenced by the Art Nouveau style. Example of Alana acid etch designs. Uh, the Kalana pieces were produced uh, and sold from 1909 to 1917. Again, you would use hydrofluoric acid to etch the design onto the, uh, onto the glass. Uh, this is a Dr. Johnson punch bowl set and two of the, uh, of the tall punch cups. 
Uh, during World War I, the company could not get one of the essential ingredients to make the fine lead crystal, that was potash, and Dorflinger imported his potash from Germany. So he made these pieces. Uh, they are done in solid pastel colors, so you could get away with a little lower quality glass. Uh, they're not uh, typically uh, cut or engraved or decorated, uh, and they are patterned or modeled after early Venetian glass. And so the line is called Reproductions Venetian. Uh, they really look very modern, but in this large court, you can really see the, uh, uh, the Venetian or the Italian influence in the design. And finally, the last art glass line the company produced uh, was opal glass. It has opalescent texture done in these four pastel colors, the lilac, the light green, uh, the amber, and the, um, uh, and the rose. Uh, and only produced uh, from 1917 to 1921 when the, when the factory closed. Uh, we are happy to report that we read the museum on uh, July 8th. Uh, all of our uh, COVID protection measures are outlined on our website. Uh, and we're open with our normal hours from 10 to 5, Wednesday through Saturday, for, and 1 to 5 on Sunday. Uh, we have two special exhibits that are up here a special exhibit featuring Team Dorflinger punch bowls. We also have a nice smaller exhibit focused on pieces uh, designed by a man named John O'Connor, who was foreman of the cutting department from 1867 until 1890. O'Connor then went off on his own, opened his own cutting shop in Holly, which is now the Lettuce Hotel. So some of you might may be familiar with that building uh, as well. And we've also been doing uh, a Sunday afternoon lecture series uh, at two o'clock. We've been very ha happy uh, to have people like Sarah and Marianne uh, be among our lecturers. And we have uh, three more of them uh, for, the, uh, for the balance of the season. Uh, Francesca Saldan, who's the curator at the Everhart Museum is speaking this Sunday. Uh, and then one of my board members is speaking the Sunday after that. Uh, and then we'll round out on October 11th with a new presentation by Kurt Reed, our curator uh, here as well. Uh, we're limiting attendance to 25 people to make sure everybody is properly socially distanced and spaced out. Uh, but if you're interested in our lectures, there's more detail on our website. And with that, Sarah, I'm gonna stop. Very good. Thank you very much, Jim. That was that was excellent information. Um, if, if if you haven't been to the, the museum, I, I would encourage you to, to go. Um, there are some really wonderful pieces on display there. Um, I think my, my favorites are the, there are cocktail glasses with a little glass cherry in the bottom. Um, and I, I really want to use them for Manhattans. Um, so we, we, do, we do have a, a few minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please, if anybody has questions for, for Jim, chime in. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Jim, um, I have an ancestor uh, who uh, was uh, born and raised in Honesdale, and it appears that at one point he and a few other uh, gentlemen created a company uh, called the Buffalo Cut Glass Company. So I'm going to assume that he got his knowledge maybe from working at Dorflinger. Can you tell me something about that company? Sure. So you're absolutely right. Many of them did. There were, at, at different points in time, a total of about 30 different cut, uh, cutting shops in this area. And what drew them, or what was the magnet, was really the Dorfinger factory, because you're absolutely right. In many instances, they worked at Dorfinger or trained at Dorfinger. And also, one of the challenges who were in the cut glass business was getting the blank. And so a big part of the expense is the furniture glass growing because Dorfinger produced far more blank and he needed to come to the purpose of the cutting. A big part of his business was selling blanks to other companies. And so you could set up a cutting shop fairly easily in the area. Uh, it could be a smaller scale or a larger scale operation. You could buy your blanks from Dorfinger. Uh, and so there were 30 of these shops Homesdale, uh, in Holly, uh, and, uh, and around, uh, around the area, and many of them 
kind of offshoots from, uh, from Dorsey. Some of them very small operations, some of them very large operations. O'Connor's, for example, had a cutting shop, the biggest Northlinger's cutting shop. That was a really large scale business. Same thing for TV Clark and Homestead, another large, large scale operation. Okay. And well, one other question. Uh, in, I think you said 1888, there was labor unrest. What was the cause of that? Yeah. So the, this industry typically was not unionized. In fact, in truth, uh, one of the reasons why a lot of these New York glass company owners were interested in relocating away from New York uh, was to avoid unionization because unions were really starting to begin to form in, in New York in the 1860s. And so um, what began to happen about 1888 is the union started to go from factory to factory and town to town to try to organize the labor unions. And they got to uh, White Mills in about 1888. They met with Dorflinger's workers, uh, got them excited about the idea of a union, and the workers went to see Dorflinger. And they said, we'd like a union. And Dorflinger said, you know, I've been pretty good to you. I, you know, I pay you well, I treat you fairly. Are you sure that's what you want? And the workers said, yes, that's what we want. And Dorflinger said, well, you're all fired. And he went to Europe hired replacement workers uh, and brought the replacement workers in, got the factory going again. Uh, and then once the factory was up and running, he rehired any of his former workers who had now changed their view on a union. So not surprisingly, those workers weren't very happy about this. And so we think that was the reason for the fire that broke out in 1892. They kind of got their revenge by setting the uh, setting the factory on fire but the factory here was never unionized a number of other factories about that time period 1888-1899 closed because of the unionization uh, effort uh, either made those factories economically uncompetitive or the managements just decided that they were going to close their, their businesses so boston and sandwich on cape cod closed in 1888 uh, there were other companies uh, in uh, in New York that closed during that time period for the same reason uh, as well. Okay. And as far as you know, uh, was he telling the truth as far as how he treated his workers and the, and the wages he was paying them? Yes. Yes. Um, so I mentioned, you know, when you saw the image of the, of the last Brooklyn factory, how he provided housing for his workers there, and he brought that to White Mills as well. So he built uh, literally most all of the houses you see in White Mills today were originally workers' homes, uh, and he rented the homes to his workers. Uh, a skilled craftsman, these skilled craftsmen, blowers, cutters, engravers, were very valuable commodities. It took a five to seven year apprenticeship program to learn your skills and your trade. So you wanted to make sure you kept those people relatively happy. They were paid at the turn of the century about $25 a week. Uh, and just as a frame of reference, Dorflinger rented their homes to them for about $5 a month. So if you're making $100 a month uh, and you're paying $5 for your housing, you're living relatively comfortably. He had a company store operated by his cousin in White Mills but that was not exclusive. And he allowed other stores in town and there were several other stores uh, in town as well. So generally he was really pretty fair uh, and, uh, and caring about his employees. I would say the two things he was bad about were number one, he didn't want unions in his business and number two, child labor. So there are stories about Dorflinger going to the local school uh, and going to the school and uh, saying, you know, you're a, a big, large boy. You should really be working in the factory. You know, you should be in the factory on, on Monday. Uh, and so what you, you see when you look at the records is uh, the men got through about like Dorflinger did, 10, 11, 12 years old in school and then went to work in the factory. Uh, and uh, a lot of the girls actually finished through high school. Uh, and stayed in the uh, and stayed in school, but that was also a pretty normal characteristic of the industrial revolution at the time. Yeah. 
So they, he wasn't anywhere close to like the, the mindset of the coal barons. No, he was, be- I, I think, considerably better than that. And especially recognizing the value that these skilled craftsmen really brought to the business, how essential they were, uh, they were to, the, uh, to the business. So fairly forward looking in terms of how he treated his employees. And you know, maybe the best example of that when he, uh, when he died uh, at age 87 in uh, 1915, uh, he was buried in Brooklyn in Greenwood Cemetery and all of the workers pro- uh, lined uh, the roadway from the, uh, from the Dorflinger home going over to the train station uh, to pay their respects when he died. And when what ended the business? Uh, the most, no one single factor, probably the most important was changing taste. So by World War I, the heavy, elaborate, ornate cut glass was starting to go out of fashion. Uh, wealthy people, uh, because of the income tax, weren't quite as wealthy as they were before. Uh, a lot of the huge mansions that he had furnished uh, in New York and other major cities, you were starting to see a lot of those come down. Uh, you weren't maintaining these large households with large numbers of servants uh, quite the way that had been done in the past. So changing pace, changing lifestyles, probably the most important consideration. Now learning that World War I uh, really played havoc with the operation of the business. Uh, this was not a, an essential industry for the war effort, but it used a lot of essential materials like coal. And so we're now finding that the government would let them run for a few days, then shut them down for a couple of weeks uh, because coal was needed for the war effort. And so that was a major problem. The potash problem was also uh, a difficulty for them as well. And then think about, as I showed my, my uh, images, how many wine glasses and decanters you saw prohibition. Uh, and that had particularly an impact on the commercial uh, side of the business. So by 1921, uh, when you added all of those things up, um, the headwinds were really pretty strong. And the company decided rather than produce what they viewed as in here, they would um, uh, they would shut the business. Jim, are there still any members of the Dorflinger family around? Yes, uh, so there are a number of them, and like most families, scattered around the country. Uh, but there is one great great granddaughter of Christian Dorflinger who lives about two blocks from the factory, from the museum. Uh, so she lives in one of the family homes at the end of, uh, of School Street. Uh, and uh, so we still have uh, one great great granddaughter right here in, in the area. But most of the rest have scattered around uh, to, to different places. Very good. I think we're, we're, we're about out of time here. Um, so, Jim, again, thank you very much for your time, for sharing your information and your, your photos. Um, I would encourage you all again to go to the Factory Museum if you if you have a chance. Um, we will include a link to your website when we pu- publish the, the video. Um, stay tuned again in two weeks for the next version of our Lackawanna Pastime series. Um, we'll be visiting, visiting another museum partner um, with Mike Pearsa from the National Industrial Museum in Bethlehem. Um, so he'll be doing a bit of an overview of, of that museum. Um, So again, Jim, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, um, and have a lovely weekend.